Our message this morning is somewhat different from what we have been speaking on, on the patriarchs of the Old Testament. Now, next Sunday, if the Lord will, we will be uh, speaking on the subject matter and the life of Esther, uh, one of the women patriarchs of our Old Testament. But this morning, I want to speak to you from the portion of Scripture that has been read and uh, basically discuss with you on the power of our words. Have you ever thought about what is the greatest enemy within our body? Well, you could name a lot of things. You might say, well, it's the eyes uh, because you see things. You might even say it's the hands because you can touch things. Or you might even say it's the feet because you can go with those feet, walk in places maybe that you should not walk uh, according to God's uh, directions. However, the one thing that is more dangerous than anything else within our body is only about two and a half inches, three inches at the most long. And that is called the tongue. In the scripture this morning, Proverbs 18, 21, a part of the text, it says that death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Then the Gospel of Matthew says in chapter 12, verse 37, For by your words you will be justified, and also by your words you will be condemned. Now, our words that we speak are very powerful, probably the most powerful thing in the world. However, our words that we speak reveal the state of the heart. Whatever is down in the heart usually is going to come up with our words. I'll quote that again uh, before the message is over. How many of you have heard the expression, Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me. We've all heard that. Well, I want to tell you that's a lie straight out of hell. Because words can hurt worse than a stick. Somebody hits you with a stick. Somebody can even beat you up with their fist. And you can get over that physically with healing. But words spoken can stay with you just about for the rest of your life. Whether there be words of encouragement or whether there be words of discouragement. You may remember things that people said to you even back when you were in the third or fourth grade in school that still bother you today that still intimidate you because of those words. On the other hand, you probably also remember compliments that people gave you when, yes, you were young and uh, in that particular age of growing and even in your teenage life, words like you did a great job or you have an artistic talent. Or when you get discouraged, somebody might say, well, you can do it. You can do what you set out to do. Go ahead and do it. And these positive statements probably motivated you to continue to pursue other goals in your life. Now the scriptures say a lot about words and how we use them either for the good or for negative consequences. Proverbs, the sixth chapter, the second verse says, Thou art snared... With the words of thy mouth, thou art taken with the words of thy mouth. And then Proverbs 12, 13 says, An evil man is trapped by his sinful talk, but a righteous man escapes trouble. And also Proverbs tells us, The tongue of the wise brings healing. So in our text where it says death and life, are in the power of the tongue, 
brings to our mind that it really makes a lot of sense. Think about it. Our words can give life or it can either give death. One way or the other, the words we speak have results. Our words can do enormous good. And you can probably go back with experiences in your life where words have motivated you and have done good for you. And then words can have enormous damage. They can hurt or heal. They can tear down or build up. Then Proverbs 10 reminds us that our words can be like a spring of refreshing water to a weary traveler, traveler in a desert land. Words. The power of the words, in some sense, shows us the image of God in us. Often, probably too often, I confess to you that I am guilty of talking without thinking, never considering the one receiving my words. Now it's easy to blurt out words when we are under pressure. Although we may have no intention of hurting others, our words can inflict great damage, much like a burning fire forest. The damage can take years to restore the damage of that fire. And some of it can never be restored. All the forest fires out west that we see on the news, true enough, it has a cleansing element and we, we set fires here in our area certain times of the year to cleanse the old undergrowth that new life can begin, but when it's damaging fire, Many of those trees and a part of the forest is destroyed forever and it can never be restored. And some were damaged in those fires and some are damaged in fires that, that will take years to restore it. Even one thoughtless word that comes from our mouth many times has consequences. And I, as I mentioned, perhaps you hear such destructive words as a child. Words you'll never be able to forget, even though you know today that those words weren't, were not true. Parents sometimes do not think when they speak to their children, when especially they're angry, especially when maybe one of the children out of two or three seems to be the redneck of the family, or, or the parent doesn't seem to like that one over the other one, and they say things such as, oh, you'll never amount to anything. You're no good. And those words out of the mouth of parents don't realize what kind of damage that does to a child. And they grow up with that emotion in their mind, say, well, my mom and dad, my dad especially, he said these words, they don't really care one way or the other what happens to me, and therefore, that child might go on and do things that they would normally not do if those words were blocked by the parents. I've known of teachers to say the same thing to some of their students. I remember sitting in a class one time and, and uh, one of the teachers said to a group of us, says, you children will never amount to anything. And the reason for it that we children live what was called down below the Sunday line. We lived in the country. We were not city folks and we were there in school within the city, even though it was a county school. And some of those teachers looked down upon many of the students that lived in the area where I was born and reared. And ironically in our senior class, the valedictorian and the salutatorian came from down below the Sunday line. I believe that today many Christians are living <coughs> defeated lives because of their words. 
So I ask a question, have you become snared by what comes out of your mouth? Do you talk negatively about your health? Think about that. And think about this. Well, grandma and mama had arthritis, so therefore I'm going to have arthritis. Do you understand what those words do for you? They're negative words about your health. What you should say, even though grandmother and mother had arthritis, I'm not going to have arthritis. I'm going to overcome this. We speak negatively about our jobs and times and our finances and our family and it just drags us down that much more. And I think we all do something that the devil delights to get us on a downward spiral. But we can train our mouth to speak better words. You see, we have a choice of what words comes out of our mouth. Romans 10, 8 says, The word is near you, it is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith we are proclaiming. We have been given authority to speak God's word in his name. Now there are many examples in our Bible where God's word is being spoken in a positive way. When the world was covered with darkness, God said, let there be light. Jesus' words to such as a man with leprosy, he said to him, Be thou clean. And to the man with the evil spirit, he said, Be quiet, come out of him. And to the deaf man, he said, Be open. And the man's ears were open and his tongue loose. In other words, those were positive words coming from our Savior to those individuals. He didn't say to the man with leprosy, well, you know, you got a bad disease here and you might have to live with that the rest of your life. No, he just says, be clean. And many times we speak those negative thoughts and words that come from the heart. Now, listen to this very carefully. We can't control the words that are spoken to us from other people. That makes sense? Now here's the thing. But we can focus on the words that we say to others. Now, let's look at the power of words just momentarily. Words have power to heal. Proverbs says, gracious words are like honeycombs sweetness to the soul and health to the body. Just think for a moment in your mind. Recall a time when someone said words that really encouraged you. Perhaps it was your mom or dad who said that. We go back to that. And I says, I believe in you. Or maybe a good friend uttered those needed words of affirmation. Don't give up. You can do it. Or possibly a teacher's words were all you needed when he or she said, you have a great gift in this area. When I look at the scripture about the honeycomb, I think about honey being a natural sweetener that boosts energy. <clears throat> Likewise, words of encouragement boost our spirit. Sweet words can minister spiritual and physical healing within our emotions. May we speak healing words with the promise of good health. Have you ever thought the tongue, that the tongue of the righteous is choice silver? Proverbs 19, 20. There are more than a hundred references to the tongue in the book of Proverbs. I want to tell you that godly people speak out of the overflow of the godly heart. There are 12 verses mentioned in Proverbs where the word heart is mentioned in connection with the tongue. And I've always said, what's in the heart, or what's in the heart, comes out from the mouth. It's like a well of water. What's down in the well comes up in the bucket. Hebrews says, the word of God is a living and powerful word. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. 
Sharp words. How powerful. I suppose when we talk about words coming from our tongues, I'm drawn to the Apostle James in his writing. James in his writing teaches us that the Holy Spirit wants to shape our character, the character of Christ in us. James puts it in a way that the tongue becomes a critical test for Christian living and Christian maturity. And if you want to ask yourself the question, how am I doing? Listen to the quick assessment from James, the third chapter, the second verse. If any man or woman, if any person can control his tongue, it proves that he has perfect control over himself in all the other areas of life. Isn't that amazing how powerful the tongue is? Perhaps you've heard the definition, a mature Christian is one who would not hesitate to sell their talking parrot to the town gossip. I'm going to repeat that. A mature Christian is the one who would not hesitate to sell their talking parrot to the town gossip. That makes sense? <laughs> the teachings from James is one of the most powerful blendings of emotional and spiritual insight on the Christian maturity I know of. And Paul frequently takes us to the heights and of the mystery and wonder of faith that James is the one who speaks where the rubber meets the road. James a little bit different in describing things than Paul was. The whole letter is a kind of thanks, I needed that. Have you ever reached that point when somebody says something to you? Thanks, I needed that. But look briefly at the wonder of the words. This is astounding. For a moment, as we consider this, we hear a word that comes to us. The physical movement that enters our ear and then the inner ear activates, listen to this, 24,000 little nerves which react through the limbic system and results in the pituitary gland sending hormones into the body. One whole physical system reacts when we hear words of care or condemnation, one or the other. And when we hear words that bring us pain and anxiety, the physical chemical reaction takes 72 hours to subside. To, to subside. No wonder some people live in a perpetual state of agitation and upset because of the words that they hear in a negative point goes through our system and it takes 72 hours for it to subside. And before that 72 hours is over, we hear something else negative. We hear another word that should not be spoken. And we live in that constant anxiety and agitation in lives. Why? Because we just can't control what we say. By God, we just got to say it, regardless of who it hurts or what the effects might be. You might think that James is harsh when he speaks of the unbridled tongue is set on fire by hell. Let me give you a short three questions True or false that you need to ask yourself this morning. I never have hurt another person with my words. Can you say true or false? I have never repeated something about another person that I did not know for certain was absolutely true. True or false. And then I never participate in idle talk about other people and other lives. A man is known in a community who started a false rumor about a fellow church member. And it got so terrible that the preacher called him in and said, I need to talk with you. And he said, I want you to go around and put a feather on every doorstep in the community and then go back and pick it up. 
And the man said, preacher, he said, by the time I get around to the last doorstep and go back to the first one, the wind would have blown some of those feathers away. I couldn't find some of those feathers. That's what our words, gossip, can do. Once it is spoken, thoughts unexpressed may fall back dead. If you think about something and never say it, it's dead. However, listen to this. I know that God is all-powerful. He's all-knowing. Nothing is impossible with God, but listen to me carefully here. God can't kill words after they are said. Did you get that? God can't kill a word after it's said. Sometimes you get a chance to read James, the third chapter, verses 1 through 12. In closing this morning, we as Christians need to set a guard over our mouth and keep watch over the door of our lips. Remember, the tongue can be a dangerous weapon. Careless and harsh and untimely words inflict pain on those who hear it. Holding our tongues at times is a challenge to all of us. Let us not be quick to jump to conclusion when we hear something about someone else or try never to repeat it. Instead, inform the proclaimer. Let's pray for the individual. The Bible admonishes us for God to search me, O God, and know my heart. May we pray. O oh Lord, would you do a work of grace in my heart first and foremost as it relates to my tongue? I want to be a servant who opens my mouth with wisdom and who speaks with the law of kindness. Lord, it's not just what I say, but it's how I say it. The tone of my voice and the timing. Lord, please, first and foremost, change me and transform me and forgive me and cleanse me and remake me and guard me. Set a guard, Heavenly Father, over my mouth. Keep watch over the doors of my lips. And may the words that come out of my mouth be the words of beauty and grace and healing that draw people to the Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the living, eternal Word of God. For it's in His name we pray and we give thanks. Amen. Thank you for joining us for this message from Reverend Wayne McDonald. We would like to take this time to invite you to learn more about our churches by visiting us at calvarycharge.com or by following us on Facebook at Calvary Bethel Centennial. Remember that we are alive together in worship. As Ephesians 2, 4 through 5 says, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved.